Top of the morning to you. This is Tacky Ty. Today we are looking at another episode of Epic History TV. This is the story of Napoleon in 1813. This is the Battle of Nations. Really where all of the coalition forces finally come together and really Napoleon puts it all on the line. Like literally everything that he's built up until this point, he puts it all on red and the Battle of Leipzig. And again, as always, be sure to check out the original link down in the description down below. Give the original content creators of Epic History TV the love and support that they well deserve. And if you have any other future video topics that you'd like to watch together, be sure to let me know down in the comments below. And let's get started. October 1813. Napoleon Bonaparte faced his greatest crisis since becoming Emperor of the French nine years before. Yeah, and this is where Austria just teamed up with the coalition. Before they were kind of on the fence, they wanted to see how the winds were blowing. And, like, Sweden is into it. They've lost, he's lost Spain. That's pretty much a done deal. And, yeah, in his old Marshal Bernadotte from the Northern Army is coming down to take uh, Hamburg, I believe. His long war in Spain had ended in Wellington. defeat, and an Anglo-Spanish-Portuguese army had now crossed the Pyrenees to invade France itself. Uh, Wellington is coming across the Pyrenees. Basically, sh he's shirred up all the loose ends in Spain, and now he's actually crossing into French territory. In Germany, the Kingdom of Bavaria had switched sides and joined the Sixth Coalition against France. And that's a ballsy move for, for them, because, I mean, they're like right in the center of it. But, While I mean, in they, Saxony, Napoleon faced four armies liberated. converging on him from all directions. And all of Napoleon's, like, troops, like, basically east of, I forget what that river's name is, um... They're all cut off. They have no supply lines. They're most likely under siege. Uh, so they're, the time is running out on to get to them, to actually not have them fall into to enemy hands, be captured, be put out of the battle, the war. What's more, these were not the same bunglers he'd crushed in 1805 and 6 at Austerlitz and Jena. Yeah. Russia, and... Austria and Russia had all learned from their mistakes. Yeah. They were now better organized, trained, and led. Yeah, because they've de been defeated by Napoleon so many times that they grew much wiser, because defeat is a cruel teacher. And more wary of Napoleon. The largest coalition force was the Army of Bohemia, commanded by Austrian Field Marshal the Prince yeah. of Schwarzenberg. I mean, Bohemia, Bohemia, like, usually has a pretty big army. I mean, whether they're, like, well organized, all these different things, like, it just depends on what age we're talking about. But they, they very consistently have the numbers. His was a huge mixed Austrian-Russian-Prussian army of 194,000 men and 790 guns. To the north, Blücher's army of Silesia, and the Blücher. army of the north under Napoleon's ex-marshal Bernadotte, now Crown Prince of Sweden. Yeah, and seeing Bernadotte, now he's like he's coming in from from the north, and he used to be part like he knows Napoleon's tactics and army structure, like all of these inner workings intimately, for being on campaign with Napoleon for so many years before going and being the, the royal house of, of Sweden. And Blücher, I mean, Blücher's well known, just, I mean, in general. Together, 130,000 men and 536 often. guns. To the southeast, Very General Bennigsen's army of Poland, besieging Dresden. Another 34,000 men and 135 guns. Yeah. In total, the coalition had fielded 360,000 men Jeez. and 1,500 guns, with Russia supplying the bulk of the troops. 
Yeah, and see, and now, like, it, j the fact that Austria has joined it, because uh, there was a chance to get Austria not in the in the coalition with them, uh, but of course, knowing Napoleon, he puts it all on the line. One unique addition to Bernadotte's Army of the North hmm. was a single troop of British rocket artillery, an experimental weapon system based on the Congreve rocket, a type seen here in 1830. That's interesting. Like that's, I mean, it, you gotta you gotta innovate. I mean, it's worth field testing live battle. I mean, why not? Although wildly inaccurate, their high explosive warhead. Yeah could Just be devastating at close range. Yeah. Napoleon's forces around Leipzig were outnumbered almost two to one. But with 200,000 men and 700 guns, yeah, the Grande Armée was still a force to be reckoned with, with many experienced troops and commanders, even though it increasingly relied on young conscripts to make up numbers. Yeah, but I mean, he still has some core marshals. Heavily relying on. There were another 140,000 men that Napoleon could not call on. Yeah. General Rapp's 10th Corps besieged in Danzig. Marshal Saint Cyr's first. And that's smart on the coalition members to try to shore up all of the basically the cities to keep them busy so they don't they can't reinforce Napoleon and. I imagine largely that's mainly from Russia, um, and well, except for the areas in Prussia. Corps besieged in Dresden. Marshal Davout's 13th Corps holding Hamburg, as well as several smaller besieged garrisons across Germany and Poland. Napoleon was currently about 20 miles north of Leipzig with the bulk of his army. Marshal Murat was 40 miles to the south, with 90,000 men, covering Schwarzenberg. Yeah, Napoleon now decided to rapidly join Murat, and with their temporary superiority in numbers, defeat Schwarzenberg, before Bernadotte and Blücher could intervene. So that, that's the best way that I could do it, is that, like if he can rush south and defeat him in detail before, like, even though they're all converging on him from all angles, like if he just gets the opportunity to get at least one in detail, I mean, it would be a significant advantage. Mura had orders to conduct a fighting withdrawal northwards. But at Liebert Volkwitz, he was drawn into major combat with the enemy's advance guard. Around 12,000 horsemen fought what some have described as the largest wow. cavalry battle in Europe's history. Murat, in the thick of it as usual, was very nearly captured by Prussian dragoons. Wow. I mean, he's, he's had so many close calls, too. Why? The battle ended in a minor coalition victory, Rocks. with around 2,000 casualties on each side. But I mean, Napoleon can't spare the cavalry either. Like, if he loses his cav, like, that, that could be devastating. The next day, Napoleon arrived to take command. This video is sponsored by The Great Courses Plus, yeah, home of more than 11,000 on... There, they have awesome documentaries there. It's France's last day. By the 16th of October, Napoleon had concentrated most of his forces south of Leipzig. Field Marshal Schwarzenberg, meanwhile, against Russian advice, had deployed his army on either side of the Pleiser River, hmm. which would hinder his movements throughout the battle. Yeah, I mean, that could... I mean, that just makes it so you can't, yeah, it's like fighting with one arm behind your back because you got to cross that river. Napoleon had entrusted the northern sector to Marshal Ney, with orders to keep an eye out for Blücher and Bernadotte. Unless you 
use that again to cross the river on the left side to try to flank him in the city. Uh, but you still, you still got that river, man. But Napoleon didn't expect them but for at least another day. At least block his retreat. If, if you're surrounding him from all sides, you could at least try to swing around the left and cut Napoleon off if he is in a retreat uh, and the battle is going that way towards the end. And so Ney had orders to transfer most of his troops south for the attack on Schwarzenberg. Schwarzenberg, however, knew that Blücher and Bernadotte were closer than Napoleon suspected, and that Bennigsen was also marching up from Dresden. This was the moment the coalition had been waiting for. All their armies converging on Napoleon, with overwhelming superiority in numbers. Yeah, they've been waiting for this for years. However, the coalition's headquarters were nothing like Napoleon's, where one man's will decided all. Schwarzenberg had to attempt to coordinate the actions of three large armies from three separate states. Yeah, too many chefs in the kitchen. And although he was commander-in-chief, his plans still needed to be approved by Emperor Alexander, the supreme commander. Whilst he also managed relations with the King of Prussia, and the Emperor of Austria, all of whom were present at his headquarters. Wow, yeah. The plan finally agreed was for General Wittgenstein's corps group to lead an attack in four main columns, with two Austrian flanking attacks west of the Pleiser. At 8 a.m., a bombardment began along the line as Russian, Austrian and Prussian infantry regiments advanced across cold, muddy fields. Wachau soon fell to Russian infantry, but French artillery fire made it impossible for them to advance further. Victor's second corps then counter-attacked, retaking the village at Bayonet Point. That's some Wachau brutal would change fighting. hands twice more that morning. These bloody contests for small Saxon villages would come to typify the fighting around Leipzig. Anytime it gets to bayonet and bayonet, like, that's tough. At Markleberg, Kleist's Prussian 2nd Corps drove out the Polish defenders after bitter fighting. While on the left bank of the Pleiser, Merveldt's Austrian 2nd Corps struggled across broken ground to attack well-defended villages. Their assault on Konowitz stalled, but with heavy losses, the Austrians got a toehold in Derlitz. On the right flank, around 10 a.m., Klinau's 4th Corps occupied the high ground of the Kolmberg and fought its way into Liebert-Volkwitz. Napoleon, observing from Gallows state. Hill, ordered up Augereau's 9th Corps and the Young Guard in support. Macdonald's 11th Corps was now also arriving in position on his left. If they can get that hill, put the cannon his up troops there. retook the Kolmberg and counter-attacked Liebert Vogwitz, driving out the Austrians and pursuing them over the fields beyond. The advance was only halted when Russian Cossacks were sighted on their open left flank, a warning that Bennigsen's army was not far off. The coalition offensive was going nowhere, with most of its modest gains lost to French counterattacks. But there was one sector where the coalition had more success that morning. General Gulai's Austrian Third Corps with orders to threaten Napoleon's line of retreat, advanced over marshy ground towards Lindenau. Yeah, the one place that actually has a significant victory is his retreat. Ney had to divert Bertrand's 4th Corps to reinforce the village and ensure the road to France was kept open. Napoleon was waiting for Ney's reinforcements before... Says northern side much weaker now that Ney 
is tied up. Or launching his attack on Schwarzenberg. But now, 4th Corps was tied down at Lindenau. And there was more bad news from Ney. Blücher's army of Silesia was approaching from the northwest. Marmont's 6th Corps had had to turn about to keep the Prussians at bay. Heavy fighting broke out around Mürkern, the village. That's too many troops up north with, you know, like, it doesn't look like there's that many French troops up there either. Like, you'd have to pull back a little bit to kind of shore up the line, probably fall back behind that river, at least. The village itself held by elite French Marines. While Dombrovsky's Polish for, division clung on hours, to Vitrich under attack from an entire Russian corps. This was a nasty surprise for Napoleon, who thought Blücher was still a day's march away. But the old Prussian general, hearing cannon fire to the south, had urged his men on and into the attack. Blücher intended to draw as many French troops onto himself as possible to assist Schwarzenberg's Army of Bohemia. Yeah, his actions and the bloody fight for Mürkern may just have saved the coalition from defeat. Gotta time up as much as possible. Napoleon was outnumbered across the whole battlefield. I mean, but in the on. south he still had a numerical advantage. Not as large as he'd hoped, nor likely to last long. Schwarzenberg and Alexander were already moving up reserves, though Schwarzenberg now found that his were on the wrong side of the Pleiser River, yeah. costing precious hours. It was now or never for Napoleon. At 2 p.m. he ordered the attack to begin. A grand battery of 180 guns blasted the enemy lines. Then Victor's 2nd Corps, Lauriston's 5th Corps, and the Young Guard began their advance. In support, Murat gathered two entire cavalry corps, 10,000 horsemen, and led them in one of the great mass cavalry charges of the Napoleonic Wars. Think about that. 10,000 horsemen charging at you. Like, it's hard to even imagine 10,000 men standing in front of you in a line at one time let alone cavalrymen charging at you, trying to get you. <laughs> Cuirassiers of the 1st Heavy Cavalry Division broke through to the main enemy battery. Some Square even up. nearly reached the three coalition monarchs. But the ground was wow. marshy and broken by fences and ditches. They even reached the emperors. The French horses were wow. soon exhausted and the squadrons disordered. Austrian cuirassiers and Russian guard cavalry were coming up from the south. When these fresh Allied cavalry reserves charged the French, a great melee ensued. But the French were eventually driven back to their start line. Maison's division of the 5th Corps was involved in a desperate struggle for Golden Gossa. The fighting swept back and forth through the village, the streets filling with dead and wounded from both sides. I love the artwork. But as Russian and Prussian guard regiments arrived to reinforce the village, the French were forced to fall back. Around 4pm, the Austrian Reserve Corps finally arrived and renewed the assault on Markleberg, one of the morning's objectives, which was finally secured. By 5pm it was clear that Napoleon didn't have enough reserves to force a decisive outcome in the south. To the north, Mürkern was being stubbornly held by French marines mm, with lethal close-range artillery support. But despite terrible losses, York's Prussian corps continued to attack. Marshal Marmont himself was wounded twice, but remained in command. Finally, a twice. brilliant charge by it's Prussian really hussars triggered a French rout. Mürkern fell, 
as Marmont's corps streamed back towards Leipzig. And they could short them up for the day. So, I mean, they did good. As dusk fell around 6 pm, fighting died out across the battlefield. It was pretty widely exposed. The first day of the battle had cost the French an estimated 25,000 casualties. The coalition, at least 30,000. Napoleon had come close, but failed to land a decisive blow. Yeah, because I mean, the chance. Napoleon doesn't have as many troops to spare, either. For victory, was slipping from his grasp. Yeah. Sunday the 17th of October brought a lull, with both armies exhausted by the previous day's fighting. Napoleon needed to rest his troops and resupply them with ammunition, which was running dangerously low. Yeah, they got enough shot to last an hour. He also sent a message to his father-in-law, Emperor oh. Francis I, oh, wow. suggesting an armistice and finally offering concessions. Uh, he's like, hey, hey, father-in-law. <laughs> but the Allies were no longer interested. No, they knew time was on their side. The only major combat that day occurred in the north, where Blücher continued to attack. Russian infantry stormed Eutrich and Gorlis. Russian hussars charged and routed part of Arigi's 3rd uh, Cavalry Corps. Got some reinforcements coming in though. That day, Napoleon received 14,000 reinforcements when Rainier's well French needed. Saxon 7th Corps arrived from the northeast. But the Very same welcome. day, the coalition received more than 100,000 reinforcements Jeez. as their armies continued to converge on Jeez. Leipzig. Colorado's Austrian 1st Corps, Bennigsen's Army of Poland and Bernadotte's Army of the North, though the latter was widely criticised for his leisurely march to the battlefield. The next day, Napoleon would face odds of nearly two to one. Oh, that's so it was time troops. for the Emperor to begin planning his retreat. Yeah, at least he knows. He's like, all right, we gotta get out of here to fight another day and get a better position because you are fully surrounded. You only have one route of retreat and if that's blocked off, then you're, you're pigeonholed in. Monday morning, the sun shone across 40 square miles of battlefield. And he shored up his line tighter, which is what he needed to. On which nearly half a million troops and 2,000 cannon were assembled. That's Soldiers amazing. from France, Germany, Russia, Austria, Poland, Italy, Sweden, the Netherlands, and even Britain. This was truly the Battle of the Nations. In preparation for his withdrawal, Napoleon pulled back his forces into a tighter, defensive perimeter, and ordered Bertrand's 4th Corps to march west to secure the army's line of retreat. Two divisions of the Young Guard under Marshal Mortier took their place at Lindenau. Schwarzenberg, meanwhile, planned to close the net on Napoleon with six converging attacks. Fighting in the south began around 8 a.m. I mean, really, the Austrians should try to put more troops on the left side where he's, where they could, I'm sure they expect him, if things don't go Napoleon's way, that he will try to retreat that way. Because uh, there's, it's really the only way for him to go. And if they could go up there and blow that bridge and like put heavy pressure on that, like while simultaneously or even before, 
doing a full frontal attack, then that could decide the fate of Europe in this single battle right now. The Austrians took Dörlitz, but Marshal Udino led a counterattack at the head of a young guard division and drove them out again. Schwarzenberg was so alarmed by this reverse that he sent orders to recall Gulai's no. 3rd Corps. General Barclay's troops initially faced little opposition as they took Wachau and Liebert Volkwitz, scenes of such bitter fighting two days before, but now scarcely defended. Barclay then paused, waiting for Bennigsen to get into position on his right before continuing his attack. Bennigsen's troops had more Trying ground to, to cover, but towards noon, they'd driven back Macdonald's infantry and taken their objectives. They would now wait for Bernadotte's army to link up on their right. But the Army of the North was again making slow progress, for which many again blamed its commander, who seemed exceedingly cautious about facing his old master in battle. Well, I mean, I'm sure with good reason. Blücher, in contrast, did not hesitate to launch Russian infantry against Leipzig's northern defences, though their attack failed with heavy losses. I mean, they're, they're getting right in the of it. By 2 p.m., yeah. Napoleon was hard pressed on all fronts, but holding his own. His attention was now focused on Probst Haida, key to his southern front, under attack from Kleist's Prussian Second Corps. French troops had turned the village into a fortress and inflicted terrible losses on the advancing Prussians. Probst Haida was soon engulfed in smoke and fire as fighting raged on all sides. Some Prussian regiments lost half their men attacking the village, while three French generals were killed as they organised its defence. And think about the scale of this battle too. Like, just, just like looking Napoleon. out to the horizon and knowing like how many troops are over there also fighting like relentlessly all like in all angles and even sent in Friant's division of the guard to reinforce the position. Like on the other side of the city, farther than you can see. To the north, Bernadotte's army was finally joining the battle in earnest. Marmont had assembled 137 guns around Schoenefeld, which poured fire into the Russian ranks. In response, Bernadotte massed 200 guns of his own. The fields were soon strewn with the dead and wounded, yeah. as the sheer weight of fire made it impossible for either side to advance. Around 3pm, von Bülow's Prussian Corps, supported by Austrian Jaegers and its small British rocket detachment, attacked Poundsdorf. Yeah. Small British rocket attachment. Just, I mean, it's it's cool that they they were even had ma men in this battle uh, rather than just giving supplies and to give some new technology and some new experimental forces. Grenier's Seventh Corps could not withstand the onslaught. An hour later, around three thousand Saxon soldiers rushed over to the enemy and surrendered. The Saxons were deeply disillusioned with their French allies. Their main wish now was for a quick end to a war that had ravaged their homeland for many months. The hole in the line created by the Saxons' defection was soon plugged by guard cavalry. But the coalition juggernaut could not be stopped. Towards dusk, under relentless Russian pressure, Marmont abandoned the burning ruins of Schoenefeld, while the if they can just hold up until dusk. Prussians took Sellerhausen. There's a shot. In the south, 
Probst Haida still held, but the situation was grim for Napoleon. The third day's fighting cost both sides another 25,000 casualties. Napoleon's army was exhausted, outnumbered, virtually encircled, and critically low on ammunition. That's Finally, the Emperor gave the order to retreat. Yeah. I mean, he... You have to. I mean, it, it's better to retreat and get better ground, resupply, rest your men, to fight another day, than to just lose them all in the Empire in vain. Overnight, under cover of darkness and early morning fog, the French army withdrew behind Leipzig's walls, and at 4am began its retreat west, crossing the single bridge over the Elster River yeah, that led back bridge. to France. And notice how there's no Austrians over there now, which again is a missed opportunity on the coalition side. There'd been time and materials to build extra bridges, but in what would prove a serious oversight, no one had given the necessary orders. Oh, wow. Furthermore, there was no clear plan for Leipzig's defence, which was left to a jumble of understrength units, mostly Poles and Germans. Napoleon left Leipzig around 10 a.m. Behind him, there were scenes of mounting chaos and confusion, the city's streets jammed with troops, guns and wagons. The 20,000 wounded troops in the city had little hope of escape. Yeah, I mean, you figure there'd be some sort of better coordination. 30 minutes later, shells began to rain on the city yeah, they know as the coalition city. launched an all-out assault from north, east and south. The rear guard held the city's gates for as long as they could but they were soon overwhelmed by the enemy, and savage street fighting broke out across the city. A barge packed with gunpowder had been moored beneath the Elster Bridge so that it could be quickly destroyed after the rearguard crossed. Around 2 p.m., a corporal lit the fuse when he saw Russian soldiers on the far bank, even though the bridge was still packed with troops, wagons and horses. The bridge was destroyed in a gigantic explosion that trapped 30,000 men and 30 generals on the wrong wow. side of the river. Panic broke out among those who suddenly found themselves cut off. Most became prisoners, but some tried to swim for it, including the Polish Prince Poniatowski, made a marshal by Napoleon just three days before. Weak from his wounds, he rode his horse into the river, but as it tried to climb the steep far bank, it rolled over him, and he was drowned. Marshal Macdonald had also been cut off by the blast, and resolved to escape or die trying. He found a place where engineers had cut down two trees as a makeshift bridge, and made his attempt. And there I was, one foot on either trunk and the abyss below me. A high wind was blowing. I was wearing a large cloak, and fearing that someone would grab at it, I got rid of it. I was already three quarters of the way across when some men decided to follow me. Their unsteady feet caused the trunks to shake and I fell into the water. Fortunately, I could touch the bottom, but the bank was steep, the soil loose and slippery. Some of the enemy's skirmishers came up. They fired at me point blank and missed me. And some of our men who happened to be nearby drove them off and helped me out. I was wet from head to foot, breathless and sweating heavily from my efforts. Marshal Marmont, who had got across early in the day, gave me a horse. I wanted dry clothes more, but they were not to be had. Wow. 
the law. That's incredible that they that record even survived. Like truly. Loss of the bridge turned what was already a heavy defeat for Napoleon into a disastrous one. Later that day, the three allied monarchs met in the centre of Leipzig to celebrate their great victory. It had come at enormous cost. Exact numbers are impossible to establish, but in four days fighting, the coalition armies suffered at least 52,000 casualties. Napoleon, who could less afford such losses, came off worse. 47,000 killed and wounded, 35,000 taken prisoner, 325 guns lost. More men were killed and wounded at Leipzig than in any European battle before the First World War. Sir George Jackson, the British ambassador to Austria, rode over the battlefield with Metternich, the Austrian foreign minister, two days later. A more revolt that would be a, a terrible sight to see. Thing and sickening spectacle I never beheld, he wrote. Scarcely could we move forward a step without passing over the dead body of some poor fellow, gashed with wounds and clotted with blood, another perhaps without an arm or a leg, here and there a headless trunk or a head only, which caused our horses to stumble or start aside. It made one's blood run cold to glance upon the upturned faces of the dead. We got over this field of glory as quickly as we could. Napoleon had suffered a calamitous defeat. He had lost the battle for Germany. His domination of Europe appeared at an end. And now he has to pull back to the Rhine. And I mean, I don't know if he has much manpower to really enforce any more conscriptions, really. With 80,000 survivors, he began a fighting retreat to the French border. There was now no chance of rescue for the 100,000 men trapped in garrisons across Germany and Poland, though some would hold out for another five months. Marshal Murat took his leave of the Emperor, assuring him of his loyalty, but secretly planning to cut a deal with the Allies to save his throne in Naples. Wow. After all of that, I mean, he's been with Napoleon for so long. He's one of his oldest marshals. And I mean, he just sees the way the wind is blowing. It was the last time the two men saw each other. Yeah. Eleven days after the Battle of Leipzig, Napoleon's former allies, the Bavarians, tried to block his escape at Hanau huh. with 40,000 men. Wow. The Bavarian commander, von Freda, had served with Napoleon in many campaigns. But on seeing his deployment for battle, Napoleon remarked, I made him a count, but I couldn't make him a general. The French Emperor then ordered the Imperial Guard to lead an attack that forced the enemy to fall back in disarray. The French tried to take him when he's down block his line of retreat so the other coalition members can come in. Army reached the safety of Mainz three days later. Napoleon himself pushed on to Paris to contain the political damage from his defeat. Yeah, that's a whole Behind other him, thing that we don't really even think about. We were mainly focusing on the battles themselves, and the might of armies, but not like we always just trying to glance over the actual political fallout of every step that he takes, like every minor inconvenience or defeat or even victory, like it has cascading effects politically. And this is like the new France, like this is every other empire is basically a monarchy and, and well, I mean, I guess France would be one too now, now that Napoleon's emperor, but 
time, his empire was being dismantled. On the 4th of November, the coalition announced the dissolution of the Confederation of the Rhine, several of its former members now joining the war against France. In the Illyrian provinces, local revolts, Austrian invasion and British naval support brought an end to French rule. In North Italy, Eugène was retreating steadily before the advance of von Hiller's Austrian army. While in Hamburg, Marshal Davout, with 34,000 troops, would soon be cut off and under oh, siege. Man. Just, I mean, Davout is an excellent marshal. And I mean, it, it's, it's sad that he wasn't able to pull back. I mean, it, it's, it would require abandoning Hamburg, which is a, 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 a really big city. Um, so it's a strategic position. But I mean, it's it's tough to try to like leave Davu at the mercy of the coalition. Napoleon's situation was desperate, but in the next campaign. But I mean, I guess if you had to put anybody there, you'd want it to be Davu, because he probably would stand the best chance to actually hold his own there fought for France itself, Napoleon would prove that he was still the master of war. Yeah. Let me know your thoughts about this epic battle, basically the, the most epic battle that history has seen in the European field to date, up until at least the World Wars. But yeah, let me know down in the comments below, and again, I will see you on the next one. Cheers.